what I'm going to do is just put three ideas in the, in the minds of our uh, panelists here, and then, as they said on Saturday Night Live, ask them to talk amongst themselves. <laughs> and I'll join the conversation a little bit. But so at the beginning, you remember I showed you that little graphic with the cars going back and forth from exploration to explanation. And I think you saw some amazing tools for exploring data today. And then you saw, especially in our last presentation, a goal of explaining to the public what the data mean or could mean. But Blackie, I think you maybe didn't give yourself quite enough credit because when you have these very interactive graphics, Sure, people can do exactly what you intend them to do with it, kind of the way you have to put it into print and give them what you think they might do with it. But then the interactivity lets them go ahead and do their own analysis, almost at the level as if they made the graphics themselves. And I'm sure that that happens from time to time. So, so that's an example of this kind of possibility of going back and forth from exploratory to explanatory tools. But I just want to bring two other ideas into the sort of topic here. And one is what our friend Edward Tufte likes to call the lie factor. So several of you talked about um, machine learning and computers and partnerships and can we have computers do something and we do something else or maybe we go to the beach, but it's gonna be very hot. Um, anyway, but uh, what I was gonna say is when you have a known bias, so for example, all of us here and many people in the audience know that when people look at lines and shapes and volumes, humans tend to systematically underestimate and overestimate particular things compared to their true area, for example. So when a computer looks at that, they don't do that, right? And so there's a possibility of correcting for that or not correcting for that. And so the more we bring machines into the visualization world, the harder it is to make choices about what it is that you present to humans because do you want to take their cognitive bias into account. Which, by the way, would mess up this explore, explain thing a little bit unless you had a little tab for is this a human or is this the computer and the data, okay? So you have to have that. And then the last point is we're having a conversation where I think all five of us and many people here understand all of these talks and what we're talking about and, and a lot of the nuance of what we're talking about. But I'm guessing that a lot of people here are very interested in all of this but didn't completely understand everything that everybody said. <laughs> and, and that's because even an incredibly educated group of people like this who come and spend an afternoon at something like this don't have the same kind of background that people are given in, say, writing. You know, so they spend a huge amount of time on teaching writing in school. But Felice and I were having this conversation the other day about visual literacy and visual thinking, and there's very little education about that. So in our very few minutes and then in our reception, what do you think about the, the role of these tools, these new tools in going back and forth between this exploratory and explanatory world? How do we take cognition and perception, this lie factor problem into account? And what do we do about explaining this to everyone? Feel free to just jump in. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up question or Go get it going? So Blackie, as I said before the talk, I'm a huge fan of your work and your Bloomberg example where you go through the climate and sort of the storytelling, I just showed in my class two weeks ago as this incredible example and we looked at different uh, visualizations with climate change data to sort of look at different strategies. But one of the questions I got, and I'm like, I don't know, is one of my students asked, but how do they come up with these visualizations? Like to me, the concept of working in a newsroom and you have to do this incredible explanatory visualization in a really short amount of time, I'm like, oh my gosh. But you must do an explore step first, right? Like when you get the data, how do you go through the sort of, I call it explore, sort of sifting your data to come up so quickly with that beautiful explanatory graphic? Well, um, first, people don't really even understand that, like what data journalists do. It's not just make the visuals, right? Uh, we are standing in a newsroom and pitching stories, and that means that we've been like reading the research, uh, and we are like calling researchers and just asking them a lot of questions, like help me understand this. Um, and um, like that particular graphic was just like a figure in the IPCC report, you know, and it was like I, I understood it was like very kind of complicated. Um, and, but I, like, we understood, like, okay, this could, you can guide somebody through it, and it makes a lot more sense. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned something about the explorer, you know, uh, like the e exploratory data analysis and then kind of just the presentation. I think uh, we do a lot of the exploration and in the act of trying to develop the story. Um, 
And then because that's the story we're trying to tell, um, essentially what we're doing is we usually try to guide somebody through something complicated and then just kind of leave them with uh, now you can explore kind of fully. Uh, so you know, this is, you know, call it scrolly telling, I kind of hate the term, but uh, you scroll and, you know. Um, but really just the process of like extracting out the parts that you think are really meaningful and, uh, you know, kind of presenting those and almost teaching the reader how to understand the chart, that ends up kind of tying into this whole like the literacy, like the, like the visual literacy of, of these charts that, you know, like they have a vernacular to themselves. So you're kind of like, um, if you do it well, you're trying to explain the chart, you're trying to guide somebody through complicated data, you're trying to simplify a lot of things, and you're trying to make somebody feel something. It's kind of, it's kind of it's a, lot of, a lot too much to do in one story. If I can, so that's great. And let me just, let me guide the sort of life factor question to you, Danielle, and then the education question a little bit to you, Arvind, because you know, you're giving this talk about, you know, oh look, I can make this complicated code less complicated code, but a lot of people don't even understand code at all. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't have to, okay? And so, you know, part of the question is, how much should they have to? Um, and what should they do? And then, you know, how much do we, do we worry that computers and humans don't see the same thing? Um, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, uh, you know, thinking about sort of how much technical expertise, whether it's um, in terms of computer science, uh, you know, coding and things like that, or even, you know, visualization or data expertise do people need to be able to build those things? And that's why we've sort of approached uh, our work as sort of this idea of layered abstractions, right? Where we're trying to raise the level of abstraction that people are either thinking in terms of, um, working in terms of, et cetera, uh, so that if you're a novice data visualization uh, 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 practitioner, we're not asking you to you know, use D3 or Vega and work at the caliber of folks at the New York Times. We're saying here is a much higher level library called Vega Lite where you can just talk in terms of, oh, I want this data field on the X axis. I want this other data field on the Y axis and so forth. And you don't need to understand what's happening behind the scenes. Um, but as you build that expertise, maybe you start you know, taking additional steps um, um, and, and expanding your knowledge and that's where sort of a system like Lyra comes into, into play, that, that drag and drop system I showed um, briefly, because what Lyra is trying to do is smooth out that entire uh, notion of abstraction. It's not fronting to the user, you know, you're using Vega Lite, you're using Vega, you're using D3. It's saying, you know, just interact with the tool in some sort of fluid way, um, and the tool will figure out the most, uh, you know, the level of abstraction that makes the most sense. Um, and so, in our user studies and in deployments, people have told us that Lyra has been a really interesting platform to teach data visualization for that, that, that reason. Right, there's definitely though another level of, of abstraction which is, you know, Michelle's question uh, essentially to Blackie of like, how do you even know what it is that you're trying to yeah. make in the first place? And that's what I think, you know, that's why I brought up the apples. Because right. in other words, when it's bar charts with apples, five-year-olds yeah. can understand I mean, it. I mean, <laughs> not to take up too much more time, but uh, the, uh, Michelle's question reminded me of um, some really early classic work in visualization was around the system called Many Eyes that was built oh, yeah. um, out of IBM by Martin Wattenberg, Fernanda Viegas, and their group. Um, they're now at Google, um, actually, in Cambridge. Um, and what they found in that system was you give folks an interesting data set um, and people will go ahead and like do really interesting things trying to find interesting patterns and interesting places in the data and tell little mini stories about it, you know, relate it to their own expertise, their own anecdotal data, et cetera, et cetera. They found all this like crazy fun activity happening for whatever reason, IBM chose not to move on, you know, not to continue maintaining that platform. But I think data journalism now gives us a really interesting sort of sandbox to explore some of those questions and again, right? The data journalists are, are talking about issues that we all care about deeply. You go on the New York Times to the upshot or things like that, they have a comments tab, luckily it's moderated, and those top rated comments are fantastic. Yet all of those folks are talking to each other through pure text, right? Even though the data journalists were talking to us in terms of data, in terms of interactive graphics, what does the world look like if we expose those tools to the readers as well? Um, yet another thing my group might be working on. 
<laughs> so Daniel, what about this perception problem? Yeah, so I think it actually builds pretty nicely on top of what Arvin was mentioning in that it's, it's an expertise thing, right? In general, we want to make things intuitive. And we have this balance of how do we help people see the right thing they need to see, and how do we help them see it accurately, and how do we make it engaging? And sometimes there are trade-offs we need to make in terms of making things engaging and making visualizations that tell the right story and that make people want to work with these things that we can't necessarily automate the whole process and that precision isn't always perfectly our goal. So we want to be able to help people understand and get the right story with their data. But there is some trade-offs that need to be made in terms of what the designer is doing. At the end of the day, when you look at historically, and this is something that Mike Glacier talks about a lot, art has moved faster than our understanding mathematically of what artists are trying to do. And so in many ways, we need to be able to leverage the expertise of the designer to try to understand and kind of embody in these tools how we should be representing data and then almost use these kinds of mechanisms where we're understanding how to do it well and how to do it right to ensure that the kinds of things and the kinds of patterns we're seeing are honest, as you said before, but not to overly constrain the space such that we're trying to automate away everything. I'm also glad you said embody because we didn't have a chance to talk at all about virtual reality or augmented reality or any kind of visual perception that's only recently become possible. So. Sorry about that for everyone. But I think now we can take some questions from the audience. How about just this few uh, of the people who are standing up and everybody else who has a question can ask it over snacks downstairs in a few minutes. So go right ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting lecture. Uh, I consider myself highly educated. But looking at all this, <laughs> I'm wondering. I think I'm lost sometimes. <laughs> So, and I'm wondering if I am, you know, I wonder how many people else could be. I have one question for you though. All this extrapolation that you are making, is it from the Y and X axis? Um, well, I don't, I think it really depends on the chart and I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, I sh there was just so much shown there today, stuff that was like two or 3D uh, geographical. So it's not just like a Y and X and Y thing. I don't fully understand. And I think if we bind ourselves just to thinking about the X and Y, well, position is incredibly powerful. We're actually limiting ourselves in terms of the vast breadth of encodings and visual representations that we could have. So there are a lot of patterns that can stand out to people that have absolutely nothing to do with the physical position of data within the visualization. Um, traditional visualization scatter plots, line graphs, there's a reason we see those everywhere, right? People understand them, they know how to use them. These are things that we've seen since we were in elementary school and they're incredibly powerful. But there are creative things we can do, especially as the variety and the veracity of the data sets that we're using change that will allow people to really more freely express and navigate and potentially see really interesting things in their data that they couldn't otherwise before. I have a kind of a perception question. Um, and a little bit of some examples I've seen, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the articles where they'll take a picture of a panda and a picture of a vulture and they'll sort of just adjust some of the pixels perfectly so it still looks like a panda and a vulture to us, but the AI will think neural network, oh, that's really a 61%, it's a vulture or a panda. And then I think it's sort of like your one with the golden retriever, because you've got that Labrador that looks like a golden retriever, but you say it's a, a Labrador. So it, seem, and so it seems as though the machines, even though we both are getting to see pretty well, we seem to somehow see differently. And then the question is, who's right, or is it sort of not the right question? That's the end of it. Does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, was the panda really made into a vulture? But we didn't notice it. Um, I, that's, a, that's a good question. I think part of our approach has kind of just been thinking about how we can use visualization to make sense uh, of what you know, machine learning models are learning and leave that sort of semantic step up to the human. Right. I think um, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, a lot of what's happened in the last few years is that people have gotten more and more interested in what these machine learning models are doing because it's true that they can do amazing things. But if we totally don't understand what they're doing, it's a little bit scary. And some of you were probably at a talk we had earlier this year by uh, Ben Schneiderman, 
this academic year uh, that was um, about algorithmic accountability. And so I recommend that you go back and, and look at that talk. Actually, I guess it was almost a year ago now. It was in April of 2018. Anyway, this woman in the blue here was the last of the three questions I said. So I'm sorry, but this will be the last question. And everybody else can join us and chat some more at the reception. So go ahead. Hi. I can't remember which one of you said it, but it really struck me when you said that um, the interacting with data was like a dialogue with the data, and you could question it and get answers. I thought that was really clever. And then later on, I was looking at it and saying, but you know, when you're doing those lovely little slide bars and things are all changing, I have a feeling that correlation isn't causation gets lost. Because suddenly, you're causing you know, you're changing X, and it is causing a change in Y. And so I'm just thinking visually to people, kind of taken one of the underpinnings, the really strong underpinnings of stats, and said, eh, nope, it does. So it was just, how do you, how do you not do that? Yeah, we don't know. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we know a bunch of stuff on the pure static visual side. We don't know a whole lot on the interactive side at all. Um, and, and part of that has been because so much of the interaction um, in terms of how we construct these visualizations has been at this extremely low level of abstraction. It's been, here is just JavaScript code. And so when you're dealing with JavaScript code, it's really unclear. How do you frame that experimentally like Danielle was with all the you know, marks and colors and shapes and sizes? We didn't have that vocabulary to even know what set of experiments we should be running to you know, ask that question you just asked. Also, I, I would just add that one other point that's really important is um, uh, when Michelle was talking about the, our GLUE project, one thing that uh, is important in, with reference to your question is that you can make these kind of interactive diagrams, but then when you're done, if you think you see something, you can get the data out and you can make new plots. And so that's true actually for some of the tools that you heard about in other contexts today. But I think that as that becomes easier and easier to expose the data that underlies the in, even the interactive visualizations, people are going to be able to make those judgments for themselves and see whether there really is a, a, a causation, not just... Um, you know, some fake correlation that they saw for a second. So it's a good question. Thank you. And so thank everybody for coming. And let's thank our speakers again. Um, that was a great job. We'll see you all downstairs. Thank you very much. <laughs>